city center of Ephesus. And as you see, the library's beauty is beyond words. It was built in the very beginning of the second century AD and the founder of the building is Celso Polemano, the provincial governor of not only Ephesus but the province of all Asia Minor. When the time for him to get retired came, he left some money to his son Julius Aquila and wanted him to construct the library onto his tomb. So his son continued and his grandson could finish the building. So practically it has taken three generations to complete the whole structure. their library but was the storage of the city archives as well and founders burial chamber is just underneath inside so it was a mausoleum too to complete the whole building took three generations and almost a decade and the scrolls 12,000 scrolls maybe some very early books were kept in the cupboards in the wall just inside of the building there are four allegorical female statues on the first floor of the building from left to right, it says underneath, Sophia, Arepi, Enoia, Epistemi. They are the qualities of Celso Polemano, the founder of the building and the governor of the province of Asia Minor in the very beginning of the second century AD. So what they are in English? Wisdom, good virtue, intelligence, and science. Again, wisdom, good virtue, intelligence, and science. Building is facing to east to benefit the sunlight as early as possible, as you can see. Its restoration was at early 70s and it took seven years and 15,000 working hours of archaeologists, restorators, engineers, technicians and workers. It was a very hard work to put 750 pieces back together. After the Greek colonization period, the Greek culture and traditions spread and Greek language was widely used in the Aegean, and it's been common language of the cosmopolitan cities. And because of this, you can see a lot of Greek inscriptions all around the Roman world as well. Marble Street is linking the center of Ephesus to Harbor and Grand Theater. It is definitely the best preserved part of Ephesus with an incredible state of conservation. It's a little more than 175 meters or nearly 500 feet long a street. The Marble Avenue was not only a main avenue, but also a part of the processional way. The sewer system underneath is one of the most developed ones of the whole ancient world one can walk inside.
Grand Theater. One of the biggest ones of the world. Has got a seating capacity of more than 20,000 people. It was first built of the third century BC by the Greeks. Greeks used the theaters for concerts, dramas, and comedies, so seven, 8,000 capacity was enough for them. Later, Romans came. Romans took the city, and Romans used the theater for the same purpose. However, on the second half of the first century AD, Romans have developed a new kind of entertainment. It was blood sports. Those blood sports attracted first double, then triple amount of people, uh, spectators to the theater, so that they needed to expand it and enlarge it. And this theater was built by the Greeks, but later was expanded and enlarged by the Romans. This kind of theaters uh, are called as Greco-Roman theaters. Today, from the theater, unfortunately, a lot of things are missing. For instance, all the seats were video with fine quality marble, they are missing. And the stage building over there was as high as the seating area, and that's missing as well, but has got so good acoustics that today, in the modern times, we have seen a lot of concerts here. The concerts of Joan Baez, Ray Charles, Julio Iglesias, Chris Deberg, Elton John, and those concerts are amazing concerts. Luckily, as a spectator or as a guide working, I was here in most of these concerts. What I suggest to you is you to go to YouTube and write down there live concerts in Ephesus and see what's gonna come. St. Paul was in Ephesus as well, at the end of his second and the beginning of his third missionary journey. As is mentioned in Acts chapter 19, the theater where the angry crowd came together against Paul is this theater. According to tradition, this theater is the one where he spoke to Ephesians. After spending more than two years in Ephesus, he had to leave because of the riot of the angry silversmiths. The location of Ephesus was perfect for the world merchants. The Western merchants came to here from islands in the Aegean and Mediterranean, Greek mainland, Italy, Northern Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, and Egypt to here with their cargo vessels to meet with the Eastern merchants who came from Asia, Anatolia, and Mesopotamia with their caravans. That is, Ephesus had been the Hong Kong of the ancient times with its cosmopolitan and commercial structure. This trade traffic of Ephesus was the main source of wealth of the city.
The location of Ephesus was perfect. It was at the head of a safe and a very fertile gulf, protected by high mountains. They had a freshwater river, very fertile hinterland, and a great Mediterranean climate. They did not have to struggle with the harsh weather conditions here. As Plutarch mentions in his famous book titled The Parallel Lives, maybe the most famous couple of the whole ancient world, Marcus Antonius and Cleopatra, came to Ephesus and made their war preparations against Octavianus here. Can you imagine that day? Marcus Antonius and Cleopatra are walking on the street hand in hand, and their gilded barges are docking at the very end of the port. The boys and the girls from Ephesus formed line on both sides of the street and throwing flowers to that couple. And the patients and the spectators on the rear plan, they are applauding, they are cheering. Can you imagine that day? Alexander the Great, Emperor Hadrianus, Vespasianus, Traianus, Saint Paul, Saint Luke, Saint Timothy, Saint John, Pope Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedictus XVI, modern time leaders, Mr. Clinton, Mrs. Thatcher, modern times great actor, Mr. Tom Hanks, by the way, I was his guide in 2004 when he was in Turkey, all walked on his Harbor Avenue of Ephesus although it's now seven kilometers or four miles away from Aegean because of the siltation. Although it's very silent, it's very quiet. It's grandeur and past splendor still amazes the visitors. This is the Church of Mary, or the Council Church. To be able to understand the importance of this building, we have to take a look at the Ecumenical Council's history first. An Ecumenical Council is the legal gathering of ecclesiastical dignitaries and theologians to discuss and regulate the matters of church doctrine, discipline, and practice. They were necessary because under Roman pressure, Christianity had diversified. In the history of Christianity, the very first seven councils represent a very special attempt to reach a canonical consensus and to unify the Christendom, and especially the first three are the most important ones. The third one of the ecumenical councils of Christendom gathered in Ephesus in 431. It was presided over by Saint Sabin of Alexandria, represented Pope Celestine. More than 200 bishops were convened 
and they defined Christ as the incarnate Word of God and Mary as Theotokos here. This council repudiated Nestorianism. Actually, there is one more council in Ephesus in 449, only 18 years later. But although it was intended as ecumenical, because of non-participation of many members, it's never been ecumenical and denounced as latrocinium or rubber council by the Pope Leo I. And the Church of Mary, you see now, is the building where the Third Ecumenical Council gathered in 431. In short, one of the most important meetings of the whole Christian world ever made in the history was made in this building. Excavations and restorations are still going on. Ephesus has got an important place in the history of Christianity as well. Notable Christians, St. John and St. Paul, lived in Ephesus and introduced the Word of God to many Ephesians in the first century. With them, as is said in Acts 19, everybody in Asia Minor have heard the Word of God. Timothy was the very first bishop of Ephesus. Also, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is thought to have spent her last years in Ephesus. Her house was found in 1891 and restored in 1954 and is a place of pilgrimage for Christians today. Every year, millions of Christians from all around the world come and visit her house. Ephesus is mentioned in Acts 18, 19, 20, Revelation 1 and 2, 2 Timothy, 1 Corinthians, and of course, in the letter to Ephesians. Eventually, because of severe earthquakes in 350s and 360s and the continuous siltation of the port zone by river Kaistros, Ephesus began to lose its importance in time. Mosquitoes and malaria were serious threats. City lost most of its population and its cosmopolitan traders. However, still remained an important Christian bishopric another several centuries. 431 AD, the Third Ecumenical Council was organized in Ephesus. They defined Christ as the incarnate Word of God and Mary as a Theotokos. 530s AD, the Grand Basilica of John was built onto his grave. The harbor was no more in use. Many Christians left the area and moved around the basilica, but the attacks of looters from sea and Arabs from land kept weakening Ephesus. As a last attempt, they constructed a fort for defensive purposes, but this was in vain. When 10th century arrived, there were only some few local farmers and shepherds living in the city. In 1904, when Turks came, they found a little farmer's village with a small population. In 1860s, the excavations started. By now, a little more than 10% of Ephesus was excavated. Today, Ephesus welcomes nearly 3 million visitors from all around the world. It is a perfectly excavated site and can tell you the best what the life was like in the ancient times.